Hey everyone and welcome to the show. It's Josephine here, your performing arts business strategist, speaker and coach. Today I have the wonderful Katie Abbott. Now Katie is a music composer and also has an arts education brand um, where she actually trains artists through the artist's mentor. So she's created this amazing online platform for artists called the Artist Mentor, which includes one-on-one coaching and other course content, which we're going to explore later today, which is great because we love talking about bringing arts education online and really um, diversifying that space. Um, We're also going to talk about the fact that Katie is forensically curious about what makes us tick. She explores our passions through music and she explores fears and motivations using contemporary musical flavors in traditional musical settings. Musing the concepts of connection, place, and humor, Abbott's compositions are performed and published and recorded around the world. So, you know, she's done amazing things across Australia, but also over in the UK and Europe and abroad, which is beautiful. Um, She's won numerous prestigious awards, including the Boston Metro Opera Gold Prize for Art Song, um, as well as the Australia Council of the Arts Fellowship Award. Look, there's a multitude right there for you. Uh, She's also got five solo albums of her work on ABC Classics and Move Records. And, you know, two orchestral works for education programs as well. So you can see here that she's got so much going on. Her work is, you know, frequently featured with the major Australian symphony orchestras as well. Um, And she's got such a wealth of knowledge which I love. She didn't actually start getting into music until like 20s. And she's going to talk about that as well, which is really exciting because it goes to show that you can achieve anything. And with this cross between, you know, her education business and her artistry, how she actually brings those together um, so beautifully. And we're going to explore that. So let's dive in. Let's do this with the very musical Katie Abbott. Hey there, I'm Josephine Lancuba and you're listening to Business Arts and All That Jazz. I've been immersed in the creative business world and performing arts industry for over 20 years. I know from experience that being an artist, a creative or running a creative business can be a tough gig, but I'm here to tell you it's possible. I went from having zero dollars to my name and living below the poverty line to then living paycheck to paycheck, to finally living a life of comfort, happiness, passion, and even stability. In this podcast, I peel back the curtain and share with you the ups and downs of my journey. Plus, I tap into the minds of creative industry experts to discover their paths to success. I know you have a spark inside of you, that little voice that tells you to reach for the stars. I wanna help you step into your limelight to have the courage to live a life you dream of, a life that you design. So get ready to be entertained and inspired as we talk business, arts, and all that jazz. Hi, Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. (laughs) Now, I saw your name pop up in the Oz Mumpreneur Network. Um, So I was very excited to get to know you because, you know, creatives in the space, we love that. Um, Tell me about your involvement or connection to Osmumpreneur. I first met Peace and Katie uh, in 2019 when I did the Accelerate Business Program, which I absolutely loved. And so I went through the the 2019 cohort. Okay, amazing. Yeah, I am. I was, you know, a part of their awards and all of that sort of thing and now do some judging there, but I've just found it a beautiful network. So that's that's amazing. I love that. Now, for anyone that doesn't know you, <laughs> you are an award-winning composer and educator. Um, you're also a very beautiful connector, which I've noticed online. Um, so let's start at the beginning uh, because we're going to talk about both um, the education side of your business as well as the artistry of your business um how did your love affair for music really start well I'm very different to most composers and most musicians because I didn't really get serious about music till my late 20s 
And although I was always a very musical kid, I never studied music officially. I never did it, never did classroom music past year eight, and I never, um, you know, took it seriously. But I always played an instrument here or there, although I chopped and changed. So I always had a deep interest in music. And I suppose I first loved music when I had one of those double cassette tape recorders as a kid. And we used to do a lot of long drives as a family. And I, I remember I used to sing I used to press record and sing and then I'd put, change the cassette tape into another, into the other record one and then I'd sing against myself and then I'd sing against myself again and I'd create these uh, harmonies. So I was always fascinated by harmony and singing. Yeah, that's amazing. And I do remember the double cassette players. <laughs> and you had to wind them and all of that and then if they got a bit crumpled they'd be destroyed I do remember that very well um, for anyone young <laughs> listening they have no idea what we're talking about right now but most of the audience I'm probably sure does <laughs> yeah that's amazing and then what actually brought so you, you've started late you've started in your 20s which is different that is absolutely different because we do know usually you know people talk about how they you know um, really studied in their youth and then moved mm -hmm. through the 20s is probably that peak of when you're trying to make it as an artist or, or get out there and actually do it. So that's interesting that you kind of started in your late 20s. How did that translate to then moving into it professionally? So you fell in love with it, but then how did that actually grow into a career for you? I really love my story now although at the time I used to feel very intimidated because classical music was not my thing I'd never really studied it although I'd played it a little bit as a kid like most people but uh, I had uh, done a teaching degree so I've always been a, a teacher mm -hmm. and I was I started a little choir at one of the schools that I was working in and I asked the uh, the principal of the school, I said, please, can I go and learn how to conduct? And, and so I went off to a conference. And for some reason, I found out that I found myself at all the composing seminars rather than the conducting ones. And from the, that week onwards, I just really wanted to be a composer. And it was the first time in my life that I'd wanted to do anything at all. I'd been a very look out the window kind of kid, you know, the one that people would label as vague I was there, mm. but, you know, happy enough to go along with the flow, but I never had any drive or direction and there are a whole lot of stories around that. So I always like to tell my story because people do make an assumption that I started composing from a young age like, like most composers. And what I love, what I've grown to like about my story and love about my pathway is that I had to figure it out myself because I was always too old for the composing programs and because I never played an instrument, I was too, um, I kind of, there was no pathway for me. So in order to progress, I had to kind of dig the pathway out myself. And I think what I learned about myself was that you, you can only do that when you really want to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I learned that for the first time, there was something that I really wanted to pursue. And I was fortunate to, um, I ended up doing a grad dip master's and PhD through the University of Melbourne in composition. So I was lucky in a way to get started there. And because I was such a hard worker and my music was starting to get noticed, I was able to progress. But I also found that I had grit that I didn't know that I had and also nous. And I found myself very interested in the whole business side an angle of being a composer because although I was intimidated by the scene that I was in because it felt so unfamiliar, I also was creating something to make it my own. Mm -mm. When you say you were too old to study and do things, do you mean that you felt that way or just because people surrounding you were much younger when you were getting into it? Like what did someone say that or was that, was that was just a feeling? Oh, no, there are programs in the arts industry for young composers, but mm -hmm. they're for young composers. And so when, when I was 28, <laughs> they were for, you know, you had to be 25 and below. Oh. And when I was 35, you had to be 30 and below. And then you had to be under 40. And I just never 
had the opportunity to participate in those learning pathways that a lot of composers go through. And they're really great programs. And mm. I teach into them myself now because compose, young composers write for an ensemble or an orchestra or you know, some setting and then their, work, their pieces are workshopped and recorded and they get to work with professional musicians. So I had to kind of find my own way in doing that. When you talk about music composition, some people may not truly understand what that is exactly. So, so what is composition? Like, what do you do? So music composition can have a variety of forms, but it's mostly making up music. And then the form that I do is music that's written down and given to musicians to play. So they're reading the music and, the, and I usually write con- music for concerts. So I write for choirs the chamber, musicians and for orchestras mostly. But Mm. um, music composers might also write for film or for ads or, you know, any variety of things. Where do you you, um, specialise in with your composition? Um, I specialise in writing, in setting text. So I love finding really quirky, outrageous, words and setting mm. them to music in part to shock and amuse the audience um, mm-hmm. but also to well we can we can talk about that but it, for me it's um, it's concert music so live music with mm. um, with performers reading okay. the music and playing and recording you've got quite a catalogue of albums I noticed <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about the process of creating the music for digital release because you seem to have quite a lot of digital, digitally released music, um, which I imagine is very different to performing in a concert hall. So those processes are quite, you know, quite different. Um, or are they performance recordings? Tell us about um, that. The, yeah, thank you. There are a variety of things, actually. And the, but the processes are different. So all of these pieces were composed for a live concert setting but because I deeply believe in recording what I write because I love that pieces should have a life after their first performance because in classical music there's there's a lot of times where people write pieces and it gets one performance and then never sees the light of day again yeah. but because I value my work um to to kind of work for me post I call it post birth once it's had its premiere and had mm-hmm. its first performance um, it's always great to have a recording because that means that other musicians can hear it and go, oh, I really like that. I want to play that. How do I get the music for that? And then it doesn't matter where you are in the world, um, people can find your music. It also means that radio stations like ABC can broadcast it as well when you've got a studio quality recording and then hopefully of course just people listening and enjoying the music. So once a piece has been Um, premiered or performed for the first time often it's a really good idea to get the the musicians into a recording studio right at that time because they've rehearsed it really well and before they go off on to the next thing that they're doing yeah but being in the studio is really really different to to rehearsing a piece it's also quite an investment I mean anything that I've had record I mean I don't I'm not a um you know, classical composer by any means, but I do write popular music for kids and stuff like that. And mm. I've brought it into a studio with a producer and brought the singers in and did all the things. And yes, it's an investment. It's quite a, it can be quite costly, unless of course you have your own studio. That's a different story. That's a different story. And unfortunately I don't, although I did own a studio. It used to be at the um, bottom of my garden, which was David Bridie's old studio because I'd uh, I'd bought his house at one point but because pop and classical um, required different setups um, I always found myself going into the ABC or I teach at the University of Melbourne I'm on staff there part-time so I'm able to use the facilities there so I'm in these incredible incredible (laughs) acoustic venues and Mm. with with incredible engineers um, putting the putting the pieces yeah that would make it a the difference having access ma- to those facilities absolutely yeah it's still I mean my first album I produced myself as in I paid for it all myself and that was a real investment into my future and I can see the impact that that 
had and then that allowed for other things to happen from that so I'm really glad that that I did spend that money Mm. uh, at that time but I really love the recording process in particularly the mastering process because I find that engineers are part of the creative process in in that way Mm. I really love including them and the way that they hear music is really different and very valuable to what they hear coming through the headphones than what you might hear if you're sitting in a concert hall. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I'm I'm very interested in the business of arts, and and I suppose um, a lot of people listening might say, well, I'm you know I'm not a composer. How does this relate? But I think it does relate because um, it, no matter what you're creating, whatever creative business you are, there is that investment side, isn't there? When you get started, like you have to creatively put yourself out there and release the work and so that's always going to be an investment and it's it can feel quite risky did it ever feel like a risk when you were putting yourself out there whether that be in a vulnerability space financially or otherwise it still feels like a risk every day feels like a risk (laughs) And I know that it's a pretty good risk these these days because I have a bank of evidence of performances and commissions and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so many wonderful things that are happening in, in my career. But as a very quiet person um, and as a creative person, I think when, we, when anyone puts themselves out there, you're, it's vulnerable. And I don't think vulnerability ever gets, I don't think you get used to that but you can certainly have tools to handle it. So I think although it does feel like a risk, I don't have the same physical and emotional responses that I used to because I've got all the tools available to me now that I can employ to go, oh, well, yeah, this doesn't feel good, but I know from all of this other experience that it's all going to be fine and I go and do it anyway. Yeah, but um, 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 I I totally hear that. I mean, it is very much... I hate to say sometimes, you know, you've done it for so long that it can sometimes be a little bit go through the motions occasionally. Like it does, like I know for me being a producer, a theatrical producer for young people, and I've just come off the back of um, finishing Moana Junior. Okay. And I and I do both original shows. I toured an original show in Melbourne last month. This season we're doing a Disney one. Um, but, yeah, it can really vary. But, you know, there is a time where, it used to just feel quite um, like your heart's racing, there's nervousness and all the things are going. But now I'm like day six in the theatre and I'm like, oh, yeah, we're on stage (laughs) again. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. we're doing it again. I mean, I don't want to be anywhere else, but at the same time I'm just thinking, yeah, it's just so much easier. The longer you do it, the more experience you have up your belt, you still can get the, that energy and those nerves or whatever, but mm. yeah, it does dissipate over time. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember hearing, um, I think it's Tara Moore, talk about the two different types of fear that, um, that the, uh, the Jewish community talk about, which is pachad fear, which is the fear of like the sufferings of imagining you know what if this happens and what if that happens or what if this doesn't happen and then there's the type of fear called year fear which is I guess the best way that I can describe it is that feeling when you're stepping into something bigger than what you're used to and it's almost like an awe and you and that excited scared I would say perhaps Mm. like if you imagine that you know you're looking you know, you're out in a spaceship and you're looking at Earth and you see how small you are, it's got that awe. And so I try and differentiate between the type of fear that I'm experiencing. And if it's the the latter, the excited, scared, well, I think that's a really great place to just embrace it all and just to step into it because it's not scary. It's just, you know, bigger than what you're used to. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. That's that that's really cool. I mean, and that's the thing, you know, I think we all do feel that fear. Um, all business owners feel the fear when you're trying something new, definitely in the creative space because it, again, it comes to being vulnerable and really putting your true self out there. Being mm-hmm. a performer, it's the same thing. So, you know, sometimes you do actually just have to step out and do it. I mean, look, you know, 
I talk a lot about um, supporting creatives. I'm very much about eradicating that whole um, starving artist syndrome. Um, and I call it that because it can be a story that we tell ourselves as well, that we don't deserve to be paid, that no one will pay us, that we have to starve for our art, yeah, all absolutely. that jazz. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, you know, so many of us suffer from that starving artist mentality or syndrome. And I'm not saying that there isn't real elements to that because there mm -hmm. are, but mm -hmm. there are things that we can do to shape it. Now, coming from a composition point of view and being the artist and the composer versus your education business, where you're actually teaching people, and we're going to talk about that, um, you know, teaching artists, I, I believe you've got an online course through the artist's mentor. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. that's right. So, you know, those two things, I mean, what's been the more viable space? Like, is it viable to be a composer and an artist versus being the educator like is that a I'm not going to say a real career I mean but you know that's how people perceive it not to be real like it's a hobbyist thing like you can't really make it in Australia or or anywhere doing that unless you're in mm. the top 10 tell me about that and the actual viability of that side of the industry yeah there aren't many composers in Australia who are only composing and able to support families and all of that doing that most composers have some other string to their metaphorical bow let's say mm. and they do that through conducting through teaching producing performing all, all of the things um however I think so I teach part-time at the University of Melbourne I'm on the composition staff there but I'm always, I've always been interested in business, so I've created the artist's mentor because mm. I found myself already um, inadvertently, informally mentoring many artists across Australia anyway, so I thought, well, let's just make this a little bit more formal and it's something that I really love. So what I find is that my composing activities and the way that I handle myself in the composing industry directly relates to what I and how I can support. So I don't, um, so is it possible? Yeah, it's possible, but you have to really have a sense of, um, I would say, robust self-worth in being in able to advocate for yourself in terms of what you get paid for what you do. And I think it really depends in the, on the type of music that you're writing, where you're writing, who you're writing for. And, you know, we live in Australia and the arts is not well funded and all of those things. So it's not just the person, it's the industry yes. as well. Yes. But I couldn't personally write full time. I couldn't compose all the time because I think I'd not... Um, I, I'm a person who likes to have my finger in many pies, I think. So I'm I'm a mum of three teens. I yeah, I, I do like my teaching, but I love the business development. I love not only the mentoring of the artists, but I love creating the business as well, because otherwise why why would I do it? So I, I like seeing how I can make what I've done already, including the pieces that I've written, work harder. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And and tell me more about this art, the artist's mentor, because this isn't a traditional studio education course or anything like that. So what exactly is that? Because you before we hit record, you were talking about how you're growing that education side of your business at the moment. So I'm I'm really interested to hear mm. more about that. Thanks. Um, so I'm a um, so as the artist's mentor. I support artists to have vibrant, aligned and joyful careers that are sustainable without the burnout. And then I do that through two programs, Thrive and Catapult, which is a six-month artist mentoring virtual residency program. So both programs are online. And I've noticed that, I've noticed the need for that because of the amount of people that I have coming my way asking for coffees or hitting me up in the corridor at a mm. at a concert and yes. just saying, oh, I just wondered, can I just pick your brain about ABC? I'm not quite sure how to handle X, Y, Z, or I'm not sure how much to charge for this, or this person said that, but it feels bad in my body. And I and so 
I thought let's let's make this a little bit more more formal. So the aim is to what I notice, and I notice this in my composition teaching at Melbourne Uni as well, is when some of the postgraduates come into my office for a composition lesson, which looks much like a piano lesson, I guess, if you want to try and imagine what that is, and they'll bring in some music. And I notice that often there's a gap and a distance between the music that they're making and who they are as a person. Mm -hmm. And I'm really interested in that distance between that and closing that up because often people are writing music that they think they should be writing rather than really music that reflects who they are. And this isn't just composers. This is writers, photographers. Oh, this is every business owner ever. ever. Like this is me when I first started my studio. Like I I created a studio that, that I thought I should have, ballet, tap, jazz. And then I realized that all I wanted to do was produce shows. And so I created the Musical Makers Club, you know, because. Right. And, and, and did that and feel risky? Oh, it did. It felt yeah. so high risk. But as soon as I did that, I finally started to get the traction because I was aligned right. with what I was actually wanting to do with myself yeah. rather than what I thought I should do. And then right. the people started coming. Right, so, exactly. Yeah. So so that's what we're looking at um, in particularly in, in my program, Catapult, because um, I noticed that I don't know what it's like in other industries so much, but I suspect it's like music, that a lot of the mentoring that happens is all done on goodwill and coincidence. There might be a one-off lecture that you happen to hear about negotiation and advocating for yourself. There might be a person that you happen to share a lift with that gives you a tiny piece of advice that changes your life, but it's also ad hoc. And yet it's so integral, this alignment, as you say, to having a successful creative practice, I believe. And so I'm really interested in supporting artists to become more aligned. So they're finding exactly the situation that you found yourself in, that when they really do ask the big question, what's really going on here, what really is true for me, and they start to take a step forward towards that new thing, then I can support them in that. And it's about all of the things that they bump into along along the way, all the what ifs, all the um, the I'm not good enough or who am I to do that or what if I'm perceived in this particular way. And we nut out uh, those, those issues for them and then I support them to take leaps towards what they're doing. And it's so, so wonderful because I've got in my current um, catapult program, I've got people across disciplines, which is incredible. And it's so wonderful to watch them fall in love with their art form again. And they're mostly established um, artists actually in this particular um, group. And they're realising that even though their career looks quite good on paper, there's more for them and that it's much they can have more that's aligned to who they are as a person. So your catapult course is for the more established artists versus your Thrive program, which is for the emerging artists? Is that sort of how? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, catapult's really useful if you've already got, uh, you're already working in your field, whether it's established or, you know, just but as long as you're working in it. So mm. you've got, because it's very, um, there's a lot of one-to-one and they have a lot of support um, from me on um sort of in the 24-7 capacity. So as things come up for them, we're kind of working um, across the six months together. So, But it's usually working with whatever comes up for them. While Thrive is a lot of the concepts and sort of a new way of thinking about creativity or at least a new way of speaking about creativity, it's all the things that we don't talk about. You know, we talk about all the the technique and the craft, Mm -hmm. but this is about, well, what happens if you feel like that person is not going to like you or you feel that you can't say no to that piece of work even though um, you'd rather not do it? Mm. So, you know, putting down boundaries, um, understanding the different types of fear, what they zing and what they yearn for, 
um, how, you know, I won't go through it all, but yeah, it's more about the concepts and Catapult is more about putting those concepts into practice in real time. Yeah, amazing. And is this all like pre-recorded lessons or do you do this actually like, you know, are you face-to-face on Zoom or how does that work for you? Because I imagine um, so- that would be a lot of a lot of work if you've got all of these people, you know, signing up to these online programs. Yeah, so Thrive um, Thrive can occur in two different formats. It's all pre-recorded videos and people can buy it just to, um, to get the training through uh, in, in their own time. But I also run it as a six-week program where the modules are dropped, um, there are four modules dropped over six weeks with Facebook support and some, some group coaching. While Catapult is really... Um, it, it really is a much more hands-on program one on one. where there's one, one-on-one. It's only for people who I really feel like are ready to do that kind of investigation into their artistic practice. And although it's not time-consuming for them, uh, it is a lot of deep work and there's a lot of one-to-one um, and some and some small group work as well and okay. workshops and things. Oh, yeah. I love that. That's really cool because, you know, especially when you are talking about the more established or experienced artists or whatever, or someone that's had those experiences um, actually working, they're going to be quite individual, aren't they? They're well, they, they are and they're not. It's really interesting. So, yeah, their pathways are all individual. Their careers are all individual. But what they bump into is all very similar. And so the... Um, but they're just the context is different. So what's mm. wonderful about the group work in Catapult is that although they're across disciplines, they can hear other people saying the exact same thing that they're thinking <laughs> and seeing them work through that and having wins. And so it's a really supportive environment where we really celebrate who they are and the wins that they have. And uh, but the the real work is done on the one to ones. Mm. Uh, with me where we're really getting specific about about things I think this is a great example of um, how education has really moved forward in the arts and it could be a a, a post-COVID thing so now everyone's so used to being online or whatever that you can really create these opportunities and these pathways Mm. I actually really love that and I think it can be applied to any um, performing arts business if you've got yeah absolutely like if you've got um you know, knowledge on a particular genre or area, you can absolutely package your expertise into an online course space. And I'm not saying a a lot of people want to do that, but I do think that if studio owners or performing arts businesses and other creative businesses um, sort of expanded their thoughts around this, it's actually great because I know from experience, I mean, the overheads of running an in-person educational service is astronomical, especially right. now with everything going up. I mean, inflation, um, you're talking about your staff rates going up, minimum wage. And I know that's great for the people. <laughs> it really is. But as a business owner, it's stressful because you're talking now, you know, they're talking about, I think, 12% super and a 5% increase in wages and all of these extras and venue hires are going up and all the things. So to be able very to difficult, have, yeah. very difficult, very difficult. So to be able to have, even if it's a side business with just a handful of clients, having that, um, that additional income and doing something that's actually really rewarding work. It's, it's great. And the flexibility of online, you know, I think that more performing arts educators can be tapping into this space. Absolutely. There's online, you know, I found when the university, we had to pivot from obviously in-person teaching to uh, online teaching during the pandemic. And I was a bit worried about my composition students. And yet I found the one-to-one on Zoom to be wonderful. And even some of the small group work was absolutely wonderful, in, just in a different way. I didn't feel that there was a lack um, in, in many ways. And what I love about what you just said is that, you know, people can do it in any way that they like. 
I think if people have a bit of an inkling, like I'm really big on inklings and Mm. inklings feel a particular way in your body. And I think when people notice what that inkling is, and, you know, if people have noticed, you know, when you were speaking, for example, that they lit up a little bit with what you were saying, they might want to go and explore how the online space could work for them, even if it's just in a small way. I think there's, there's so many ways that's, that can be particular to you that you can make it work. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, going from, you know, the artist versus the, the music teacher versus the business owner versus the mentor, I mean, you've got so many wheels churning, but at the same time they're all in the same wheelhouse, right? Um, totally. But do yeah. you have a preference? Like what? where is your true happy place? Like are you mm. only teaching because, you know, you couldn't get more of this or you mentoring this, you you know, is there a happier place amongst all of that? Um, Yeah, I'd like to just switch my balance up a little bit and I Mm. am in the process of doing that. So can I tell you about my, uh, one of my musical projects, which might help explain what my happy place is. Um, It's a project called, um, so I won't forget the question, I promise. (laughs) Oh, don't worry. Um, I love a good tangent. (laughs) (laughs) So one of the, I often tell this story because it was a real pivot point for me. Gee, I hate that word, don't we all, aren't we all sick of it now? Uh, yeah. um, in, the, in the way that I compose. So I mentioned earlier that I like the pieces to work really hard for me once, once they've been performed and that, that they can have another life either in recorded form or being performed by other artists. But I started wondering am I just going to keep writing music like it's great like it's really cool that I can do something that's really fun and that I get these great performances but to what end and I started I started to notice that I had a yearning to do something with a bit more meaning within my music and I ended up writing a couple of very big works which were very challenging because I'd never written big works before called Hidden Thoughts and these two pieces, Hidden Thoughts 1 is called Do I Matter and Hidden Thoughts 2 is Return to Sender and these two works really epitomise who I am as an artist. So we're talking about alignment before so this was bringing that meaning of who I am as a human and as an artist into my music and what I do because I'm quite good at setting text And I like it. That's where I can find humour in music. And my big musical goal is to write really virtuosic music for the performers to play so they're having so much fun while while making sure that a classical, someone in the classical audience, no, let me, I didn't say that well, while trying to reach people who wouldn't normally go to a classical music concert where they just think, wow, this this is fantastic because I'm not a classical musician I didn't that's not my background and it's just the environment where I grew up really I guess um, as a musician so I want like my mum and my brother and all of these people who don't really know music to be able to come and go yeah I get this this is great music and so I interviewed by anonymous survey I interviewed women um, and I did the Kaz Cook helped me actually devise these questions because of her own work And I asked them, what have you learned to be brave about? And what would you like to be braver about? And tell me, do you have any thoughts about hidden? Do you have any thoughts about any hidden thoughts and any thoughts about courage? And I got over 200 responses from all over the world, from women aged 18 to, I don't know, I know there was a category for 70 plus. And they told me all of these hidden secrets that they'd never told anyone before all based on grief and love and sex and body image and loss and some of it was just hilarious and some of it was gut-wrenching dreadful Mm. and I I collected the text and I only used the text in the piece and one of the um one of the phrases was do I matter am I loved and so do I matter became the title for hidden thoughts yeah Um, and that became a one-hour um, concert setting uh, piece, which then led me to return to sender. And this is based on letters 
that unfortunately I was the one who opened them, but they were written by Australians, 2,000 letters written by Australians of support and encouragement that were sent to the asylum seekers on Nauru. And they were sent over a couple of years and then one day they were all sent back, all 2,000 of them, unopened and they weren't delivered to the people for whom they were intended. And I remember reading about this in the newspaper and I felt really angry because I always wanted to write a letter when I'd heard about the call and I never got around to it, you know, kids, busy, blah, blah. And I'd always felt bad because I thought thought, I'd really like to write a letter of support and encouragement. And I wrote to Julian Burnside, who was the instigator of this particular call, and he gave me the letters and I opened them. And I spent a couple of years opening the letters and writing pulling out the beautiful, amazing words from Australians about their lives, about what they hoped for these people and the generosity of spirit and, you know, they put in photos and drawings and shells and incredible things into these letters and I was the one that was opening them. It was both an honour and terrible all at the same time. Yes. And I got to pull out these stories. It would from be these letters. almost like a heavy responsibility to it was, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to set the words to to music. Um, and I had a narrator and a singer with a string quartet. And then that became a one hour work. And the beauty of that piece is although it, the performance was COVID cancelled, Uh, It was meant to be May 2020. Um, It got broadcast on a digital platform where it was video, a video broadcast live. And some of those asylum seekers who happened to be in the hotel detention centre in in Australia, and they were able to zoom in and hear the words that were meant for them Mm -hmm. uh, live. And so I guess as as an artist, I've discovered that my, what adds meaning to my artistic practice is supporting voices that are not heard so the hidden voices of women or hidden thoughts of women and then these letters that had been suppressed and not not heard by the people who were meant to meant to hear them and I in in essence I suppose I can take that into my artist mentoring because I really believe that artists need to have strong voices and often as you say, you know, they've got the starving artist syndrome, we've got the I'm not good enough on who am I and, all, yes, you know, all absolutely. of those things. And so the strong voices don't get heard because we go along to get along. And um, in my mentoring, which I suppose is my also my happy place, is, is about helping people or supporting people to align so deeply. So as I found my own alignment in my own artistic practice, I'm able then to take those lessons into the mentoring mm. and um, and I'm starting to do that more in the university. So as long as I'm, you know, as you say, it's all in the same wheelhouse, but now it's a very specific wheelhouse and often um, I find myself mentoring quiet artists, you know, introverts or people with high sensitivity or those kinds of things because, I don't know, they find me. I think because <laughs> I'm like that, and and we, and, and I guess, no. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I love that though. Place. That's amazing. Yeah. So I guess that's my that you know the hidden thoughts. That, that's my real heart, and the mentoring is my is is my heart. So yeah, but they feel together. They feel aligned. Yeah. Okay, that's beautiful. Who or what inspires you? I call myself magpie because I've always don't I've always hated those questions you when you're asked as a kid you know what's your favorite color and what's your favorite piece Mm. of music and I've always like oh I don't have one I don't have one and then I realized oh it's because I like a whole range of different things so I love really I love I love so there's so much that inspires me nature inspires me no end no end I love, this sounds really weird, but I love alone time. I love silence. And even though I'm a musician, you'd think I'd love the sounds, but I really love the this, this space and the silence. And I feel more inspired when I'm just sitting quietly in silence. Suddenly the world is, is full of possibilities. 
well, just in the hub hubbub of normal life, I don't find that. So I read all sorts of different things. I read poetry, I read self-help books, I read newspaper ads where I collect things from. And so I feel like I collect things from all sorts of different places and pull them together in a way that has meaning for me. And Hidden Thoughts is a really good example of that. You know, I yeah. throw out some questions to the world randomly. And, and you got such an amazing response. Such an amazing response. And people, I've got to say, at least at least half of the people, maybe more, specifically thanked me mm. for allowing them the space to think. Because some people wrote essays and have really terrible stuff and really beautiful things. Um, and other people, it was just a really simple line. But really funny lines, you know, and of course with the different age groups you've got different things. So I love picking out random things that feel good to me or that are true for me or that are interesting Mm. and pulling them together to create something new. Yeah, I love that. So what's next for Katie? What's what's up next for you? So I've got a few things coming up. Um, In the artist mentoring space, I'm going to be opening up applications for Catapult again soon. I'm really excited about who might come my way to work with because I've just loved that so much. I've loved seeing their growth and excitement. Um, In For Thrive, I'm going to be opening that up as a standalone course, so that'll be happening in the next couple of weeks too. And with, uh, with music, I've got a really probably the biggest piece of my life coming up and I can't say too much here Mm. except that uh, it's a very big piece with one of the um, one of the big uh, orchestras in Australia that um, that I'm that feels very aligned with with who I am as an artist and uh, I'll be sure to let you know um, when when that's all announced but that's going to take me a good year to write and uh, I've got some artist residencies happening uh, in order to do that and okay so yeah. where can people find you if they want to find out more information where's the best place for them to go uh, the best place is my website katieabbott.com and I'm katie with a y and abbott double b double t perfect we're going to put that in the show notes for everyone as well so if you want to check out katie and what she's got coming up um, you'll be able to find that all on her website So thank you so much, Katie, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Uh, We did have a couple of (laughs) rough moments, didn't we, trying to organise this, just some scheduling clashes. Thank you for being patient. (laughs) So glad because it's been um, really beautiful. And, you know, it's funny because you talked about favourite colour and do you know what? I don't even know what my favourite colour is anymore. (laughs) I don't. It used to be red and now I don't even know. It's like, who Ooh. am I? I don't know. I, it's like, why don't I have a favourite colour anymore? What's wrong with me? But after what you said, I'm realising it's because I like lots of different things. <laughs> you're, you're allowed to. <laughs> and I'm allowed to not have a favourite colour. I'm allowed to like lots of colours. So, <laughs> Do you know, there's, I heard this really funny thing. Well, it was funny to me. I think it's quite serious. Um, but in the Irish or Celtic language, there's uh, when you don't like a question that someone asks you, like, what's your favourite colour? You say, and I'll spell it because I don't know how to say it, but it's M-U. I want to say moo. Mm. And when, when you say moo, what that really means is I have, you've asked me a question, but there's a better question to ask. Mm. And so you're kind of inviting them to ask you a better question. I like it. I love that. Well, I hope that I've asked you good questions during this interview. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie, for being on the show. You take care. It's um, so much fun. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed listening and would like to hear more, be sure to click subscribe. If you're really feeling the love, share us with your friends. To work with me or to simply find out more about the magic of creativity, arts and business, head to my website josephinelancuba.com and you can find me on socials. I also have a book that I've co-written with a bunch of amazing entrepreneurial women called The Women Changing the World and you can grab a copy of that at josephinelancuba.com forward slash books. Thanks for listening.